Always. We ask the question. What is needed in the world? Is that going to be? Refugees clashing with riot police. This was the scene at the Hungarian border recently. An image of Europe, but certainly not a complete picture. The policy of Sweden, for example, has been the opposite. Here, migration officials have been deployed to train stations, meeting and greeting arriving refugees. We're just here talking to people arriving to Sweden and uh, telling them what we do as a migration agency and telling them about like what they can get help from us with. And despite the fact that more than 10,000 people have been denied asylum in Sweden, many are still in the country escaping deportation. All of this creating the picture of an open door policy. And the numbers seem to back that up. No country in Europe is taking more immigrants per capita than Sweden, not even Germany. But the policy has a downside. Many new arrivals here are languishing in temporary housing. Beggars and homeless live in the streets. Some neighborhoods with many immigrants have seen an uptick in violent demonstrations. Not the picture of Sweden that existed just a few years ago. At the same time, there's another issue preoccupying the Swedes. Russia's takeover of Crimea has reverberated in the region. Many people here are now so worried about the Russians, they're advocating giving up Sweden's traditional non-alignment policy and instead joining NATO. So many changes sweeping across this part of Northern Europe, and we'll explore all of them with Stefan Löfven, the Prime Minister of Sweden, as he talks to Al Jazeera. Prime Minister Stefan Löfven, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. If Absolutely. I can start by talking about one of the biggest problems facing Europe, the refugee crisis, this flow of refugees. It was quite a steady flow for the last four years. Now it's growing. Sweden has taken in per capita more than any other country. Tell me why you're taking in so many people. We, we are very clear on our principle. It's a moral principle and we are also obliged by international conventions and we will stick to that. Uh, every individual has a right to seek asylum in Sweden. And uh, so if someone comes into our country seeking asylum, yes, we, of course, we let them seek uh, asylum. And those who are approved, uh, of course, uh, they, they can stay, but those who are rejected need to go back. So stay for a temporary period or stay as long as they want? Syria, we have a permanent decision because in Syria, we can see that conflict is not going to be solved in, in the near future. And that is why we believe if you get a permanent uh, decision, you will likely uh, be possible to, to integrate to the Swedish society in a quicker way. Yourselves and other countries like Germany have a welcoming attitude. Across Europe, though, there's very, very different opinions about what to do about this. This is a major crisis facing Europe. Doesn't Europe need a united, comprehensive position? And all it's got is division. We do need uh, a common uh, decision and, uh, and a policy. And that is why, I, I, since I took office, I've been working with that. Uh, I brought it up with uh, Chancellor Merkel in Berlin in February. We, we managed to get the EU to take another decision in, in June, a step forward, yet another deci decision now in December, a step forward, but it's not enough. We need uh, a mandatory system uh, to distribute uh, the refugees within the European Union. Now we're working on that and uh, we, I've been very clear that we need to have a common solution because you cannot hand this uh, responsibility one or two, to one or two countries. It's a, it's a common responsibility and I'm sure that EU must show that we can act together. And when I listen to, to African leaders, when they sit on the continent in Africa and watch EU uh, handling this uh, decision in such an odd way, it, it's, it's a bit strange. So we need to get our act together. Obviously, this is a humanitarian response to this right. situation, but there is an argument that refugees or migrants, whatever you want to call them, could actually be an economic benefit to Europe with its aging population. It is, clearly. So uh, it is an effort. We're making an effort right now because we, we are receiving uh, many people. You need to find uh, housing, schools for the children, of course, and everything needs to be uh, in a good manner. 
But in the long run, we know uh, Sweden, for example, I, I always argue, look at the 70s. We received many people from Chile, from Argentina, from Uruguay. And after uh, the democracy was, was uh, installed in, in those countries, some of them went back, some of them stayed. And I think it's, a, it's an asset for our country to have people living in both uh, Chile and Argentina and Uruguay who know, they know Sweden, or people who stayed. Uh, with that context. So it's good for a small country. It's an, it's an asset in a global economy, yes. What do you say to the argument that Europe should tighten border controls around the edge of Europe? It should strengthen its coast guards. It should stop people getting in, build walls, fortress Europe. No, uh, we need to have a balanced policy. Yes, we need to have control uh, over our borders. That's absolutely uh, fundamental uh, because uh, uh, that's, uh, that's also a task for a, a single country. So that is, is absolutely necessary. But we cannot prevent people from uh, getting a, a chance to seek asylum if they need. So we're not closing our borders for refugees. No, that's not the answer. But we have to have control over our borders. That's, that's the definitely important. When you look at a country like Hungary, it's built in the last few months a 175 kilometer fence along its border with Serbia. It's deployed riot police using tear gas and water cannon. When you see those sort of pictures taking place yeah. in Europe, what's your reaction? That's not my Europe. Tear gas and, and uh, attacking uh, individuals in that manner, that is not my Europe. That is not the European values. And certainly not uh, saying uh, like the Prime Minister in Hungary did, that some are welcome, but not Muslims. That is not, oh, that is not Europe. So we need to stand up for the European values. Uh, order uh, on our borders, yes. Control, yes. But also people who are fleeing for their lives, they need to, to get into to Europe, and they have that right. The High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations told me he believed that Hungary might be breaching international humanitarian law. Should the EU take action against Hungary? That is up to the Commission to do that, whether a country is following or not following our, our values, our principles. Uh, so that is, that's something the Commission can do any time. Uh, but I'm clear, I believe that those kind of statements about Muslims is not, is not in, in line with our principle, our moral. Uh, so, uh, and also the acting of the police with tear gas and so on, that's, that's not Europe. That's not the Europe we want. But when you look in Hungary, many Hungarians seem to support those hardline policies of their prime minister. Are Hungarians less humane people than Swedes? No, I, I've also seen uh, Hungarian people helping uh, refugees uh, in the train station. Uh, they they uh, came there with shoes, so they, they wanted to help uh, refugees and the children with, with shoes. So I'm sure the Hungarian people know it's, this is not the Hungarian people. Uh, I know they, they are also, uh, they are also, they also believe in solidarity. You've mentioned this before, but let me just be clear. How exactly should Europe decide who to let in? Who is a genuine refugee seeking asylum and who is an economic migrant? Let's look at the two largest groups coming into Europe right now. Syrians. You'd let all Syrians in. I think you've already said that. What about Afghans? Yes, also everybody can seek asylum, but our authority, and this is not a governmental decision, we, we uh, have given the, the authorities the mandate. You handle this according to international rules, uh, conventions, and uh, domestic Swedish rules and, and law. So they handle that, and they, uh, of course, investigate when, they meet, when the individual comes to the border and, or, or into Sweden and is seeking asylum. They have to, of course, be registered, identified, uh, tell their story, and then it's up to the authority to decide whether you have the right to, to stay or not. But in terms of those coming from Syria, Syria is such an awful war zone. There's such yeah. turmoil yeah. there, yeah. you wouldn't turn anyone away. No, uh, not likely, no. Uh, it's, uh, again, it's up to the authority to decide individual per individual. That's their decision to make. And, and they know uh, what kind of rules they need to, to stick to and he adhere to. And so it's an individual decision uh, made by the authority. And what about Afghanistan? Because for the last 14 years, 
the international community has been involved in Afghanistan since 9-11, trying to rebuild the country. Lots of international troops led by NATO. You're not a NATO ne member, but you, I saw your we, troops when I was yes, reporting yeah, from yeah. Afghanistan yeah, there. Yeah. We were Is there. it an indictment of what the international community has done over 14 years that so many people still want to leave Afghanistan. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it's devastating for the country. Uh, and of course, we have many uh, young people, uh, youngsters from, let's say, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. And I met them myself in Sweden. Uh, and of course, it's terrible for the country that so many people want to leave. It, 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 doesn't, uh, it doesn't strengthen the country, of course. It, it weakens the country. But it, once again, if you see what they what they go go through, sometimes uh, of course you understand why they're leaving. But and and not everybody is approved. Uh, but again, it's up to the authority. But you're approving a lot. Just get, give us the numbers. How many have you been approving in the last? In years? Afghanistan, I can't. No, tell no, you no. That. In terms of the total number that are coming into Sweden. The yeah, total number, we uh, I guess it's some something around uh, four to fifty thousand. Uh, so if you if you count everybody who comes to Sweden and you, you count those who, who should go back to the country where they came from according to the Dublin Convention and uh, those who are rejected, uh, I think we have an approval rate of something around 60-65%. And the Dublin Convention is one of the things that isn't working. That's You're supposed to apply for asylum in the first EU yes. country yes. That, you, that you visit, but yes. clearly that can't work, can it? They can't. All these people arriving in Greece can't all apply in Greece. It would be deeply unfair. Exactly, that, and that is why we have this relocation within Europe. Uh, we decided on 40,000 in, in June and July, and on 120,000 now in September. How do you relocate them? But it's from hopelessly Greece behind the Italy. curve. Sorry, 120,000 and 40,000. There already are 500,000. Exactly. That's and that's my point when I discuss this in the European Union. Uh, the problem, the situation it doesn't go away with 120,000, it's still there. And so we need a long-term solution, and that is the mandatory system. That is why we are, we are fighting for the mandatory system, because it doesn't work today. So we have to find the system uh, in the European Union as a whole, and also tell refugees that they cannot choose what country to seek asylum in. Uh, we, we will let them into the European Union, and then we, we need a system that reallocate, relocates uh, these people to the different countries. What do you say to those who say that the open door policy that has come from Chancellor Merkel and from yourself is actually fueling this, encouraging people to make that dangerous journey across the sea? Now, I, I don't see that uh, people who doesn't want to, doesn't have a, a, a good reason, a good cause to leave, that they will leave just because we say we, we welcome you if you, if you get here. Uh, they are fleeing because because their lives are, uh, I mean, in ruins. The whole country is in ruins. It's it's almost five year war now that we that we uh, looking at. So no, I, I and they don't do this uh, terrible uh, and dangerous journey just because we say uh, we welcome you if you if you have if you want to come here. Uh, I don't think so. They are in trouble. These are people uh, that, that have experienced terrible things and, and uh, they're fleeing for their lives. 250,000 people dead, as you said, four and a half years of war. Are you frustrated by the international community's response to this? For example, the UN Security Council can't reach a common position. Yes, I am frustrated and I brought that up with the, within the European Union also with the Chancellor Merkel and, and the other leaders that the European Union also need to, to stress this much more. We need to reach a solution. I understand fully this is very complex. It's not an easy solution. Uh, it's not going to go fast, but we need to start somewhere. And I believe that the United States and uh, Russia, they are uh, key players, they need to sit down and find a way, uh, find a dialogue that can start uh, eventually, that can that can lead to uh, an, uh, negotiations as well. And even if it feels somewhat unpalatable, maybe allow President Assad some sort of role, at least for a time? We cannot see that uh, the regime has a role to play uh, in the long run, because uh, this regime is still bombing I its own uh, uh, citizens. Uh, so no, that's, that's not uh, uh, the answer. But the most important thing now is to stop the killing, stop the bloodshed. And in doing so, you need to, to find solutions that are, are uh, uh, compromises that both sides can live with.
in one way or another. And the, the most important thing now is to, to get US, Russia, and the Security Council, not least the, the other three permanent members, and the Security Council as a whole. You need some regional players, I'm talking about Saudi Arabia, Iran, to be active in this process. And the main thing for us, the most important thing is that we, that we support the United Nations uh, peace process and that we support Staffan de Mistura, who's the envoy for Syria, uh, in any way. And we are ready to support uh, any way we are asked to support. So uh, let's focus now. Stop the killing, stop the bloodshed as soon as possible. How do you sell these policies about what to do in Syria or the inaction on Syria and, and, and explain the inaction on Syria, but also how you're dealing with the refugees at home? Because it's controversial, it's a polarizing issue. You just look at the support for the anti-immigration party, the Sweden Democrats. Since, since your election last year, they've doubled their support. Yeah, but the reason, the reason Paul is sure they, they actually decreased. So, it goes up and down. Now, I fully understand it is a difficult situation and also people in Sweden are worried, can we handle this situation? At the same time, I saw a poll last week that showed that the support for, for refugees has increased since, uh, if you compare to February this year and now, it has increased because people see also not only st statistics, not only number, they see individuals. And when you see that little boy uh, on the shore, and when you see other individuals, human uh, faith, you, I mean, uh, sorry, what they have experienced, they understand these are human beings, just as us. So there is a worry, yes, uh, it's clear, but we have a support and we have to show the strategy, uh, uh, the whole strategy, meaning you, you need to deal with the Syrian crisis, but also what happens at the African continent, continent of course. You have to do that, you have to find a solution that is common for the whole European Union. It's not only a responsibility for Sweden and for Germany and, and other countries. And you have to make sure that you can, you can do this in a good way in Sweden. We can handle the housing, the schools, and whatever need to be taken care of so we don't have a, 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 a disaster within our country. But we can handle it. Swedes I've spoken to talk about a sense of unease, that there is in places a great deal of social division, there is poverty, you've had trouble in your third city, Malmo, where there have been uh, various violent attacks. You have perhaps, different from the past, you have people sleeping in shacks, in, in parks, uh, you, you have uh, recent figures showing that Sweden's children are not doing as well in their tests compared with other children in Europe. Is this the Swedish model we know from, say, 20 years ago? Uh, the problems in the school uh, is not directly connected to the fact that we have received many refugees. That's another problem. The problem in our school was that the previous government, they choose to lower taxes before, uh, before actually adding resources to the school. Now, this government, our government, has not shifted. So we're not investing. And that is the answer. Uh, you need to invest in, in schools, in infrastructure, in housing. You need to make sure that people can get a new job and get a job. Because, of course, if you have lived in Sweden your whole life, if you have been unemployed for a long uh, period, of course you're worried about the future. And that is why we're showing now these Swedish people, yes, there is another way. We can invest. We can do this together, uh, make sure that people uh, get a job, that uh, the young people get their, a proper education. If we, if we invest together, we can do that, meaning that we can handle the situation both for those who have lived in the country for a long time, but also for the people who are coming into the country right now. And these people together will build Sweden. I appreciate there are different issues, but it adds to a perception of the public, or some members of the public, that perhaps things aren't going in the right direction. And that is why, no, it didn't go in the right direction, because the, the Conservative government choose to lower taxes, 140 billion Swedish kronor, mm. instead of investing. And of course, with that policy, people in general, whether there are refugees coming into the country or not, People are worried. I was a trade union leader. I was traveling all around the country. And before uh, the refugee crisis uh, came, long before, people were worried because they, were, they didn't see the uh, secure future for themselves because of high unemployment, 
reduce social security and those kinds of things. We are investing in that now so people can feel secure. Yes, I have a place also in the future project for Sweden. I'd like to raise some other issues with you. Ukraine. It looks like Russia's won in Ukraine, doesn't it? In effect, they are going to keep Crimea forever and they have a policy in eastern Ukraine that manages to destabilize the rest of the country. That's what they wanted, isn't it? Well, we need to stick to the, to the policy that uh, the annexation of, of Crimea war is uh, a breach of international law. Well, you're uh, we, answering we, it now, but no one's no, really no, talking no, about we, it. No, but we, we need to stick to that because otherwise we will acknowledge, well, it's, it's up to any country to grab a part of uh, another country uh, with violence. And that is not international law. And for a small country, the international law is absolutely uh, uh, so important. And for everybody, it needs to be important. If we cannot stick to those rules, we will have disorder all over the planet. So we need to make sure that we stick to the rules, never, uh, never leave that policy. And also now uh, in Ukraine, uh, we need to make sure that the Minsk agreement is fulfilled. And we are supporting uh, Ukraine politically, we're supporting them financially because we think it's important now that we show Ukraine that uh, you are part of the, the community and uh, the rules uh, applies to you as well. Does Sweden feel threatened? Because there's a growing support, I think, for Sweden to join NATO. Why are you opposed to that? We, uh, we don't feel uh, an immediate military threat. Uh, we see what Russia is doing in Ukraine. They behave also more aggressive in, the, in, the, in, in our neighborhood, but we don't see Russia as an immediate uh, threat to our country. Uh, nevertheless, we need to think about our, our capacity to defend our territory, and we are determined to do that. That's one of the most important issues for a, for a, a government, of course. So we are increasing our own military capacity right now. We have just reached an, a uh, a five-party agreement that is very strong will increase our own capacity. We are increasing our cooperation with Finland, with EU, with NATO, Poland and others. So, so we're not alone. We are cooperating in, in a variety of ways and we, we will do that. No, we stay out of, uh, we are not seeking uh, a membership in NATO because we think it's good for us, ourselves, to have that uh, integrity. It gives us the, the flexibility to, to defend our country in the best way we can. But we're not uh, neglecting uh, our neighborhood area. We have, a, we have a, a, a pledge also to the other country. If something happens to another country within the European Union or the Nordic countries, of course we will help them in the way that we can do best. You are not seeking membership of NATO, but you are seeking a place on the UN Security Council. Tell us maybe finally how your policy on refugees where we started tells us something about Sweden and why Sweden would be good on that Security Council. As Sweden, we have a long history of uh, humanitarian thinking and we, we, we're not naive. We, we don't think we're a superpower, but we can make a difference. Also small and medium-sized countries can make a difference. We will champion the perspective of the, the small and medium-sized countries. We are a military non-aligned country. Uh, we are a, a big funder of the United Nations system. We, we put in a lot of resources because we believe in the United Nations and the system. We need a world community, an organization that can, can, uh, can bring the world forward. So that is absolutely necessary. And with that history and with our engagement right now, uh, we, we keep increasing our funding to the United Nations system. We believe also that since it was almost 20 years ago since we had a seat on the Security Council, we think it's time again. It's a Nordic uh, candidacy. We are supported by the Nordic countries. So yes, we, we want to do our part and take our responsibility and, and serve for, for two years, uh, 2017 and 2018. Prime Minister Leven of Sweden, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here.